Now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally. We're very busy today. Coming up, bankers under the parliamentary spotlight again. All the latest analysis from ANZ's Shane Elliott and NAB's Phil Kronikan with CLSA's Brian Johnson and our own Leah Shanahan and Annalise Nielsen. Bingo Industries gets the go-ahead for its half a billion dollar acquisition of Dial-A-Dump Daddy. My interview with CEO Daniel Tartak a little later in the show. Mortgage brokers want a bigger slice of the pie after successfully getting both sides of government to backflip on scrapping commissions. Leo Shanahan speaks with Mortgage Choice CEO Susan Mitchell and Chairman of the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia, John Hewson, on his latest initiative, the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative. More on that later. First, just a word about how regulation and regulators are shaking up the banking sector at the moment and not everyone feels it's in a good way. After the Hain Royal Commission, it was clear that banks, their senior management and their boards had indeed dropped the ball, lost sight of what their duty to customers was and indeed, as ASIC's James Shipton said today at the AFR Banking and Wealth Summit, there were shocking lapses in plain old professionalism. But Kenneth Haynes writing instructions to regulators to litigate first is causing a lot of angst and debate. Former competition czar Graham Samuel, who is leading the review into APRA, said yesterday that just one banker going to jail should be enough to put the fear of God into everyone and litigating first as a strategy could be both costly and very time consuming for ASIC with cases often taking years. Mr Samuel said the regulators needed to uh, bare their teeth and I think we can say that under James Shipton at ASIC along with two new commissioner hires there's a lot of growling going on already. ASIC Deputy Chair Daniel Crennan QC said today that ASIC's why not litigate stance will mean more civil and criminal cases and there'll be more from the Royal Commission including the fee for no service litigation. And Karen Chester, hot to trot from authoring the Productivity Commission report on super is going to be chasing returns from her new seat at ASIC. But just as important is what's happening in the responsible lending area. Access to finance has apparently got much harder for those wanting home loans, but also for small businesses. Credit is getting tighter. Here's ANZ Chief Shane Elliott today at the committee hearing. I think I mentioned at the, at the time of the interim report actually that I found it confronting both personally and professionally. It was an opportunity for me as a reasonably new chief executive to look at the failings of our institution in essentially one uh, process and under one document. And that was a humbling and confronting experience to see the extent of errors that we have had, uh, the common themes in there, uh, and, and when the, the fact that when we've got things wrong we were not good enough at fixing them or holding people to account. For the organisation, it's also been a real wake-up call. And uh, right from the beginning of pre preparing for the submission, getting the interim report, and then obviously through the, my own testimony and the final report, we've been determined to use this as a call to action in our bank to make sure that we fix the mistakes of the past and ensure that they never happen again. Well, Shane Elliott was joined by NAB's acting CEO and incoming chair Phil Kronikan and both of them were warning about how credit was getting tighter and how responsible lending was part of the problem. But today, ASIC's Jane Shipton was having none of it down at the summit. He said they've been in, in force, these laws, for a decade and they're nothing new. Uh, it's extraordinary, he said, that I'm up here today saying something as simple as obey the law. Well, the bankers are definitely pushing back, aren't they? AMP chairman and former CBA banker David Murray's comments to me this week were on exactly the same stuff. And in these election campaign heavy times where the coalition and the government are wrestling for the title of best economic manager and also best bank basher, hmm, it's interesting to see how things will play out on this. Well, let's go to today's banking inquiry. Your Money's chief business reporter, Leah Shanahan, joins me live at the desk. We also have Sky News political reporter, Annalise Nielsen, joining us from Canberra. Uh, guys, both of you were watching this. Annalise first. Um, how did you see Shane Elliott's performance? What were his big concerns? 
Well, he had a few different topics that he hit quite well. It was interesting to see him talking about that resp uh, responsible lending, as you were talking about, but he did have uh, quite a few interesting points, in particular about the remediation program being run through ANZ. It was quite notable comparing the performance to NAB as well. We have seen traditionally a much more contrite showing from ANZ, and it really was matched by NAB today as well, which is something perhaps we were expecting after they did have that uh, complete upheaval in the wake of the Banking World Commission's final report. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting to see him speaking about different issues that the banks had with their change management program and uh, just the money that's being spent. It's quite a significant amount. I think about $300 million in remediating customers. That didn't go unnoticed by the panel. Yeah. Any use of the word agile anymore or has that kind of disappeared? <laughs> No, it's consequence management is the new buzzword coming out of the banks. We heard that more than a few times and it's uh, definitely raised the ire of a few on the panel. It was probably one of those points where uh, the business jargon hits the real world and doesn't quite translate. Okay, all right, Leo, uh, interesting what Annalise was saying about both a bit more contrite, but for yeah. NAB, quite important to be so, yeah? Well, very much so and I think Phil Kronikin filled that role today that was necessary. Uh, <laughs> there would have been real problems if he didn't, mm. but uh, yes. Yeah, quite a contrast to the appearances of Andrew Thorburn. And sort of saying actions, kind of, actions speak yeah. louder than and, words. And uh, he was concise, generally speaking, in his answers and, you know, started off with an apology. It was very clear that it, the bank had let its customers down and we were sorry for that. Interesting comments around lending. Uh, Shane Elliott also had some very interesting comments around lending. Elliott seemed to be saying, look, there's no doubt that maybe we'd been a bit cautious trying to send a signal that the bank's open for business. But as you said, linking that to some degree with responsible lending laws. Mm. Uh, Kronikin actually said, look, the rate of lending and the rate of approvals is more or less the same as what it was a year, year ago. The problem is the speed at which it's being done and the demands on people to prove uh, that they should be able to get the loan. The, the rate of approvals actually hasn't changed that much. But So you're getting a drop in the demand side, uh, which I found kind of interesting. He wasn't actually blaming the banks, uh, a credit tightening per se in the bank, saying it's a lot harder for people to actually prove, which begs the question, mm. Well, they were obviously getting loans previously, uh, perhaps that they shouldn't be, right? I mean, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's harder to get Which the loan Which at least now. now is probably a good thing. Um, I mean, in, in terms of, yeah. you know, things getting tighter and the economy turning downwards. Now, uh, Annalise, um, optically, obviously, these, uh, these sessions are having more, happening more and more frequently now uh, with our uh, big bankers. Um, how, do you th how useful do you think it is for Parliament? And was it very opportunistic between the government and, uh, and Labor in terms of bank bashing? Oh, absolutely. It has become a bit of a pastime to bash on the banks and in the lead up to the election it's certainly uh, no signs of slowing down but it was interesting to see just the pace of the questions coming and it did seem like it was perhaps everyone a bit more used to the rigmarole of how these commissions are going. It did seem like everyone knew what was expected of them in particular with NAB. Um, they had the exact performance they needed to and probably would have saved them a lot of grief if they'd done this uh, same kind of performance in early hearings but it is something where we didn't actually see too much political point scoring today which was really interesting we did see a bit of argy-bargy about brokers uh, commissions and that's something that uh, both Labor and the government have backed down on so I don't think either was trying to push that point particularly too hard yeah, yeah. Leo, of course, all in the background at NAB, we've still, we're still waiting for a chief executive that's going to be fronting these, uh, yes. these sessions. In yeah, future. Phil Cronican was asked about that. He was asked whether this would happen by the end of the year. He kind of laughed and said, basically, well, I hope so. Uh, he said there's a committee, a uh, it's, it's number of committees. Slow, isn't it? I mean, they've just I mean, they're hired. Are... They're only just advertising that they've hired, you know, this this firm Heinrich and Struggles. I think that's that, that's yeah, doing it. Yeah. Um, so how far off is this? Phil Cronican obviously seemed a bit frustrated by the process, saying, "Look, we really hope to whittle that shortlist down quite soon yeah. and begin interviews." And still in the mix, we've got. Oh well, you know, of the the same contenders, uh, you know, yeah. the, Mike Baird. Uh, we've got. You know, others talking about overseas, uh, former RBS. Uh, oh, Ross McEwen. Ross McEwen. George Frazzi uh, still. Fra Frazzi is still in the bank. He's departing and, West Bank. Um, yeah, and, and Craig Drummond, of course. Craig Drummond. Who and may or may not want in New Zealand, job. no doubt. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll. And any, anything, anything your end on that, on that front, Annalise? 
No, no insight on that one. But it does seem like uh, from a few of the people I've spoken to, there is a competitive advantage to drawing that process out. It gives the interim CEO as much time as possible to take out mm. the trash for the next person to come in with a bit of clean air. So it could be mm. a deliberate uh, tactic on the bank's part. Very interesting. Annalise Nielsen, Leo Shanahan, thank you very much for that. Let's stay with the theme of the banks. Brian Johnson was speaking at the Banking and Wealth Summit, the AFR's one, uh, and he's also been following, of course, all the latest with the bank CEO testimonies this week and uh, um, their um, intentions or otherwise to spin off or delay spinning off bank assets. I spoke to him a very short time ago down at his CLSA offices. Brian Johnson, very nice to talk to you down here at HQ. Uh, the banks are off today, I suppose, not surprised given that two of the CEOs were in front of politicians today. Yeah, they're not really up or down a lot, um, and it's just kind of like in the normal realm of the market move. But there's no doubt about it, the Australian banks have been underperforming now since their peaks in about March 2015. Mm -hmm. They're down a long way, but they keep on underperforming. Look, I noticed that both Shane Elliott and indeed um, Phil Kronikan were both concerned about the consequences of the tightening credit and the responsible lending laws that seem to be making life a lot more difficult for them than they had expected. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. But, but when we come back, it, it's interesting how the narrative kind of changes a little bit. This idea that credit is fundamentally tightened, previously the banks were telling me it's just that people don't want to borrow. Um, what I personally think is going on, back in the old days when I used to go to a mortgage broker and perhaps he might have filled in a lot of the forms for me, mm. it, now that I've got to genuinely verify all that stuff, it might feel a little bit tighter than it genuinely was. But I think as ASIC is saying, you know, the rules are the rules. The rules have always been there and perhaps we, credit was a little bit too loose before. So has it really tightened? at the edges. Very interesting you say that because of course James Shipton was strong on this before. Yeah. The laws are what they are and it's about um, you know adhering to the laws. So what uh, do you think Brian are the big challenges for the banks now then? Well there's two. The first one is that when we have a look at Australia generally we've been in this phase where house prices always go up. Everyone feels really good. We get a very positive wealth effect and what happens is households have gone out and consumed that. What we can also see, however, is we've had a background of very little wage growth in Australia um, and yet we've had consumption hold up. Uh, what has been happening is people have been consuming their savings. Can you do that going forward? What happens is the wealth effect on housing reverses. So what we can see at the moment is we can see this kind of deleveraging in the economy. You can see it particularly in the auto industry, but generally things are slowing down. Mm -hmm. And the other gigantic risk that we have is despite the regulators telling us how resilient the banks are, the fact is that the New Zealand, the RBNZ in New Zealand is coming out with a much higher capital proposal than we've got in Australia. And if I was a New Zealand regulator, it makes a lot of sense what they're doing to me. But that creates a little bit of a capital ripple here in Australia, which potentially could actually disrupt those dividends. And that's really the only reason you buy them. So mm -hmm. what we see going on in New Zealand is probably the biggest issue. So you think that APRA could take a look at that and want to increase the buffers here? Well, the, the problem is that generally when we talk about bank capital, we talk about it at the group level or the consolidated level. Mm. But the consolidated or group level is the addition of Australia and New Zealand. Mm. So if the New Zealand capital requirement goes up, your group level probably doesn't change, but your Australian capital goes down. And that is a problem for APRA. Now, they're still waiting to find out where the rules will sit, but at the moment, we're talking about quite a big issue, particularly for ANZ. That's very interesting. And, and there was some scuttlebutt about some of the banks looking to maybe exit New Zealand. Do you well, see that happening? Yeah, well, there's another rule coming down the channel called APS222, which basically says you can't have more than 25% of your capital in a subsidiary. And if ANZ were to recapitalise the New Zealand business up to where the RBNZ is proposing, it would be 33% of the capital base which means unfortunately for ANZ it's probably too big to hold. So we'll have to wait and see how they resolve this. But if the Australian banks were to one way or another exit their New Zealand businesses, it's anywhere between 25% of the earnings and about 10% that would have an impact on their dividend capacity in Australia. And where do you think we are in some of the sales of the other assets? Because of course uh, since we spoke, I think um, the personal financial planning business is being sold by Westpac. Yeah. Equally other divisions in, in other uh, of yeah. the big four banks are being slowed. 
Yeah, there's no doubt about it. What we've seen is we've seen Westpac basically exit financial planning. Just be aware, though, um, the revenue crunch there is massive. The earnings are down about 75% this year. Now, part of that is basically the change in the fee structure. Part of it is planners departing. But when you have a look at it, you can see this massive revenue crunch. Um, and the other thing is that it's just not logical for banks in a world of kind of differ different capital construct to own a lot of these non-banking businesses. So, um, you know, this is a global trend. We're seeing banks go back to being banks and stuff that isn't banking basically divested. Um, and that's going to happen. That's going to continue to happen globally. We mm -hmm. certainly see it in Australia. Uh, Phil Cronican, of course, really got his first outing from the media's point of view today. Uh, I mean, from what you've uh, heard and read of his uh, statement and how he went with the politicians, how would you rate him? Well, in NAB, and I think the media have missed the point, is the reason why we see management change at NAB is because the previous management team was saying one thing but probably behind the scenes doing another, and there seemed to be a genuine reticence to actually with the fee for no service to actually genuinely remediate their customers. What we can see with Phil is a real decisive move to go and address the stuff that has to be done. So stuff that is inconsequential, for example, closing down a few branches wouldn't save a lot of money for NAB, so they're not going to do that because it would have hurt the brand. But you can see with Phil, they're getting back and they're actually doing what needs to be done. Um, all the banks at the moment have got to be contrite. Um, that just goes with the patch, but I think in NAB's case you can certainly see actions actually happening, which mm -hmm. is great news. You've got to remember, NAB has been a perennial underperformer for decades. Um, I interestingly, when I speak to clients, however, a lot of people aren't aware that when we actually have a look at share prices, Westpac has even underperformed NAB over the last 10 years. And that's something that Westpac should be thinking about as well. They need to lift their performance as well. All right. Well, you're not really happy with the big four banks at the moment. Uh, you continue to be very inspired by Macquarie Bank. Yeah, and it's pretty simple. When you have a look at Macquarie, we can see that investment banking and financial markets are quite challenging at the present time. Macquarie don't do a lot of the normal FIC business, fixed interest currency and commodities. They're much more commodities, particularly US natural gas, which is going really well. But the really big story in Macquarie remains that with global warming, whether you believe in global warming or not, the fact is that energy markets will decarbonise as we move towards renewable energy. That's a massive infrastructure investment that is required. And I think Macquarie has got the best leverage to that of any company in the world by virtue of the fact that you've already got this infrastructure management business, but they also bought Green Investment Bank in the UK quite cheaply. Macquarie is the play on decarbonisation. Mm. Brian Johnson, so interesting. As usual, thank you. Thank you. After the break, ASXX listed a bingo industries has the green light for its dollar dump takeover. CEO Daniel Tartak will be with me next. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, Bingo Industries has completed its, some would say, controversial acquisition of Dialer Dump. The ACCC gave the waste management company the green light for the $570 million takeover last month. As flagged by the regulator, the deal makes Bingo the largest building and demolition waste collector and processor in the country. Bingo appeased the ACCC by committing to the divestment of its Eastern Sydney waste processing plant. The acquisition comes at a good time for the company. Bingo flagged a profit downgrade back in February, causing the share price to plummet by almost 50%. So where to from here? Well, I'm very pleased to welcome Bingo Industries CEO Daniel Tartak, who joins me live at the desk. Daniel, welcome. Thank you. Now, uh, good news on your growth story. What will Daddy, what will Dala Dump actually do for the business now that you've got the green light? Yeah, we finally got the green light. It took a while, but yeah. no, Dollar Dump is transformational for, for Bingo. Mm. Uh, it basically enable us, enables us to be vertically integrated now in New South Wales, making us the largest operator in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have the opportunity now to build a recycling ecology park, something that really will bring forth our strategy and vision for this country in, in, in solving we, what we believe is a potential waste crisis in this country. So when you talk about vertical integration, what do you actually mean there? So basically, the Eastern Creek facility will enable us to handle every type of waste in the market, mm. from food waste to non-food waste mm. uh, at that facility, and we'll be vertically integrated across collections, processing, and ultimately recycled product sales mm. and landfill disposal. Well, when we think back to this, uh, you know, China basically closing its doors on some parts of the, our waste that we want to throw out there, I agree with you, it is a, a major uh, crisis. You, you 
uh, raised money to actually take over uh, uh, dial a dump and uh, Ian Maloof uh, was p partly for shares as well so Ian Maloof and indeed family the Maloofs and the Tartax will be in the business together yeah yeah we sure will be uh, yeah we've been competing for a very long time now we've joined forces so yeah we raised 425 million dollars back in August to pay for the most part of the acquisition uh, Ian Maloof now will hold 12 percent of the company and will be a non-executive director mm -hmm. uh, so yeah Ian, Ian brings 35 years of waste experience to the business so um yeah, I very much welcome his knowledge. And, and you chaps support. are all going to get on? Oh, most definitely. Okay. And we are getting along. Sure. So from an investor's point of view, I mean, there are a few things which makes it difficult to, to know what to make, with you, uh, make of you. Um, you were obviously plagued by short sellers last year um, and then um, kind of sort of fended them off and then really shocked the market, I think, by that uh, uh, profit downgrade in February. Uh, given that everybody was saying, no, this is coming, this is coming, look at the market, why did it take you so long? to announce that downgrade? Yeah, so the downgrade was disappointing. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the, the, the slowdown in residential market came quicker than we expected. Uh, we had hoped that we'd, we would offset that by the infrastructure spend and the infrastructure work, and to an extent we have. Mm. Though the uh, residential part of the downgrade was only a small part, so there are other factors contributing to our downgrade, uh, like a delay in our price rise as a result of the or partially result of the delay in the uh, Queensland levy, which will come in, in effect July 1, yes. and reconfiguring our network on the back of the dollar dump acquisition. So several factors caused the downgrade. Yeah. Uh, and two of those three factors is more of a timing issue where the profits will be sort of moved towards FY20 instead of FY19. Yeah, so for the full year? So for, for oh, sorry, for the next half, what, what, how do you see things playing out? So for the next half, we, we still see a softening in residential construction, which yeah. was flagged back in February. Yep. Uh, though FI20 is looking very promising for our business. And I suppose the Maloof business, the Dollar Dump business, actually then allows you to spread your risk on that front. Most definitely. So yeah. the uh, Dollar Dump business is less exposed to residential construction. Mm. They're more weighted to the infrastructure cycle. And as we know, it's got another five or ten year uh, lifespan and they've got some really good contracts of material coming through so, so we, I guess we're more like of an in, uh, we're sort of moving more towards like an infrastructure based um, right. business with the dollar dump asset. So the other issue and it was you know to go, go back to that uh, ABC Four Corners program which exposed uh, some of the the, 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 the underbelly perhaps of what was going on in in the waste business now how as an investor do you deal with the reputation of the waste business and make sure people, especially in this day and age, when we want to be responsible investors, they were actually doing the right thing. Most definitely. I think the Four Corners thing was a great thing for the industry. Honestly, and that's why I played a role in, in, in that interview. So mm. what it did was highlight that waste is an issue in this country. Mm. So guess what's happened in the last two years? People are talking about waste. Mm. It, there is an issue. We need to invest more into our recycling infrastructure in this country. Mm. I believe we're probably the largest investor in recycling infrastructure in New South Wales and Victoria. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars in the last few years. We, spend on, we plan on building a recycling ecology park at Eastern Creek, yes. investing a further $200 million into a recycling park that can accept all waste types in the market, which yes. will go a long way in solving the, partially the problem with the China sword policy. How are you going to go with your relationship with the EPA and this sort of idea that more volumes are getting getting delivered to waste month the dumps than you've actually got um, permission to dump? Sorry, like. what do you mean by that? Well, volumes that come in, volumes of waste come in. These, the criticism was that more volumes than was permitted under the EPA were coming through to some of the landfills. Uh, our landfills or no? Or Generally. Oh, yeah. so, so no. So yeah. The problem is right now is there needs to be more investment in, in, in infrastructure assets. Yeah. We need more recycling facilities in this country to deal with waste coming back from Queensland, yeah. to deal with waste not going to China, just to deal yeah. with population yes, growth. Yes, because just to fill everybody in, the, the, the levy, which is now uh, going to be put on, what is it, $75 a tonne in waste levy in uh, Queensland, is going to stop all the trucks heading up there and dumping. Yeah, it, it might not stop all the trucks, yeah. but it'll stop a great amount of trucks. And yeah. yes, there's a lot of waste coming back to Sydney, and we need yeah. to deal with that. So bingo. We've got three sites offline right now in construction which come back online next year. So we are gearing up for, to solve part of the state's problem. Yes. Um, yeah. So we, we believe we're doing our part there. And yeah, it, there's waste everywhere. It should be such a fantastic opportunity and growth business. One can see that. Um, equally, waste around the world attracts uh, words like mafia, crime gangs, black money. Is that alive and well here? Should we be worried about it in your business? No, no, definitely not. I think the EPA and governments are doing a lot to drive out the rogue operators in industry. I think there's rogue operators in all industries. Mm -hmm. So. 
Uh, there's definitely increased compliance in the industry in the last two years. a lot of cash years. in this industry, isn't there? Um, well, we don't see a lot of cash in our business, mm. but definitely potentially in parts of parts of other businesses. Mm. But no, I think the EPA is doing a great job in driving out rogue operators. Mm. I think the more people talk about it, the more the more governments invest in recycling. I think the more it's yeah. going to contribute to the economy and actually. Uh, raise the profile. And back to the family again, buying land is obviously crucial to um, being able to expand your business. Uh, you know, there's obviously family, uh, family um, ownership of certain lands and uh, leasing deals being done, related party transactions, how does that all work? Uh, so no, not anymore. Uh, all the land that the family owned is now being bought by the company, so no, those related party transactions, uh, you know, it was always a transition from IPO, taking a family business into the corporate public world, so no, those transactions are, are, now, are now finished. So blue sky ahead. Sure is. It's a great opportunity ahead for us. We're very confident about the growth of the company, especially in FY20. Yeah. Daniel Tartak, really good to talk to you. Thanks Thank so you much. very much. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Okay, after the break, mortgage brokers push for more concessions. Mortgage Choice CEO Susan Mitchell, next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Yes, welcome back. Mortgage brokers are pushing for more concessions following the bipartisan backflip on controversial changes to broker commissions. Mortgage Choice says that Labor's proposal to replace trailing commission with a 1.1% upfront commission instead of scrapping bank to broker payments completely doesn't reflect the value of a lifetime of trailing commissions. But Mortgage Choice CEO Susan Mitchell says it's a good place to start negotiations. Well, for more details on this, Your Money's chief business reporter, Leo Shanahan, spoke with Ms. Mitchell a little earlier. Susan Mitchell, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Now, you must be still celebrating a uh, great victory that you've had uh, over the coalition uh, in many ways, I would say, because uh, you've made them backflip in policy. They've uh, now said that uh, uh, trailing commissions could be allowed under a new government, at least for a three-year period. Take us inside that campaign and uh, how did you achieve that outcome? Um, I don't know that we made them backflip. I'd like to think that they thought it out and thought that perhaps maybe the structure that we have right now is actually a very good one for brokers and perhaps looking at remuneration structure in about three years would be a great plan because you can then look at the governance structure first so I, hopefully that's I'm sure that's the plan but the um, campaign the I, I'm very proud of the mortgage broking industry they did, did get together they put aside any differences they might have from different groups to different groups and they all worked together under the MFA MFAA and the FBAA to really support the campaign both as a grassroots writing to their their um, MPs as well as a social media and distributing all of the collateral that was created for the campaign okay the campaign itself uh, as I said what was pretty effective though um, Mark Burris seems to be taking uh, a fair bit of credit for for it. Uh, how important was Mark Burris's role in it and what was your role personally in this? Um, Mark Burris I'm sure is, a, is a, a stalwart lobbyer and has been down I'm sure lobbying for the mortgage broking industry way before the Royal Commission actually came out with its final report. My role in all of this has been more along the lines I've been supporting the MFAA, I've been rallying the troops in Mortgage Choice to ensure that they're supporting the MFAA, as well as participating with the other CEO aggregator heads to lobby specifically for the mortgage broking industry. Right, there were reports about, of course, Mark Bruce's uh, friendship with uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Uh, how important was that in, in the uh, campaign and did you have meetings uh, with the Prime Minister or any other senior ministers about this? No, I didn't. I was not privileged enough to get to meet with the Prime Minister. Um, I wasn't in the room with, mm. Mark, with Mark Boris and um, the Prime Minister, so, but I'm sure that Mark Boris was in there fighting for the mortgage broking industry. All right. Well, you said yesterday, though, that at a, at a conference that yes. uh, the mortgage broking industry will continue to push for more concessions. Uh, what would those concessions be? I, the, the number that's being talked about right now, and right now we're talking about really the labour model that's been proposed. Mm. Um, and 
they have actually put out there a number of 1.1, and it's being bandied about in the press as if that's the, the total remuneration that would actually be paid to the mortgage broking a industry. A 1.1 commission. Commission, yes, 1.1. So it's more of a, it's still based on the size of the loan, but it's a flat commission, mm. so that a flat rate. So you wouldn't be incentivized to go to a particular bank because every bank would pay the same 1.1. But the point is really that 1.1 is not economic parity with what's actually paid now. And I I think that it's important not to get too caught up in that number and to wait until after the election and whichever party is in place we need to speak with that particular party if labor is the one that does come back in may we would want to continue to work through with them and talk about what it is that the brokers now being asked to do that's above and beyond what they do today the additional risk that they're taking on with um, best interest in the client, for the client. And all of those things actually are raising the cost base for the brokers. So to actually come out and have 1.1 be the number is actually not economic parity with where we are now, and we're adding more costs. So I think the important thing is to continue to have those discussions so that we can explain that to both the Labor Party and to the Treasury Committee. Okay. But as you said, that it's much more likely that uh, Labor will be in government come May. The uh, that's what the polls that's are saying. That's what the polls are sh showing. So let's just assume that's going to be for, yes. the, for the time being. Uh, what is your plan then in dealing with a Labor government? Have you already met with some shadow ministers uh, to put your case forward? We have had um, different... Um, our our associations have had the opportunity mm. to meet with the different shadow ministers. And... Um, have some discussions. The discussions have not been um, very broad or very deep. I think the most important thing is after an election is to actually work with Treasury so that we can go very, very deep and understand exactly what the implications might be should we choose to move to an upfront flat rate model. Okay. And uh, would you campaign in the election uh, favouring one party using your uh, campaigning tools, which have been shown to be effective thus far for one party or another, in much the same way that unions do for the Labor Party? I think the important thing right now is to... Oh, you're, you're really asking me. You're really... Um, I actually wouldn't want to push the Labor Party too far right now, because a, a, a decision made without enough information is actually probably not going to be the best one. I really think it's better to have a deeper conversation after the election. Okay, but at, at this point, let's say that Labor are going to the election yes. with that policy. Would you campaign against that policy? You don't. You you appear to be considering it at least. I would be campaigning for which party it is that I actually supported. I wouldn't okay. base one decision of who to elect for Parliament based on one decision. Okay. Now, look, on another sub subject, uh, the CBA has delayed its spin-off uh, of uh, its wealth yes. business, including uh, Aussie and 25% of, and of, of yep. mortgage choice, 20 or 25? 17. 17, sorry. Um, now, look, your reaction to that, uh, are you uh, annoyed that it's been delayed? Uh, would you like to see this you know, just done, given that it seems inevitable? Um, I think my reaction is more as I'm not surprised. Mm. It's a very, very difficult thing to do to divorce the two companies. It's, there's so much remediation going on right now. I'm not actually sure how you spin out that group of companies because there's also some financial planning groups in there as yeah. well that are probably under some remediation. I'm not sure how you spin that out to a shareholder and explain to them, I'm going to give you this little group of things and it's got kind of a lot of problems mm -hmm. in it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Yeah. I just don't see that that's a great shareholder outcome. So I actually was not that surprised. So I said it was inevitable. You don't seem to think that it is inevitable. Have you had any discussions or any indications from the bank that they might not sell off their, their share in mortgage choice? Oh, I, I would assume that Mortgage Choice at some point would be sold off. Just because it doesn't go, they don't have the spin-off, doesn't mm. mean at some point they don't sell us off. They've made it very, very clear that the things that they were putting in that new co were not part of their ongoing strategy. So I assume at some point that share in Mortgage Choice will be sold off. Don't mortgage brokers need to disassociate themselves with the big four, given the findings of Hain, given your own, your own arguments around uh, the independence of mortgage brokers? Isn't it necessary that this is done? 
I think that is the preferred model. Actually, Hain never came out and talked about vertical integration, which was a big surprise in the results from the Royal Commission that he didn't address vertical integration in mortgage broking or in financial planning, implying that the um, conflicts that exist there could be managed. So I thought that was a very interesting finding. I think it's better for the mortgage brokers to be off as independent companies. All right, onto the housing market itself. Yes. What kind of reductions are you seeing in the amount of money that people are being offered to borrow and the amount of applications uh, that are coming in? The applications are reducing. We're not seeing the same level of application that we saw a year ago. That is mm. definitely down. The settlements, as far as our settlements for the six months ending December, were down about 12% compared to the previous year. Um, yesterday in the AFR summit, the, the CEO for CoreLogic, Lisa Clays, came out and said that um, the property prices are off 8% in Sydney, you know, maybe make it up to 10%. She foresaw that actually they would continue to go down. They wouldn't shoot down, but they would mm. continue to go down and be down for a little bit and come back up maybe 2021. All right, Susan Mitchell, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate you asking me. Very interesting lady, Susan Mitchell, I think. Now, a huge theme this year has been ESG, environment, social and governance influences on investing. This week, a new sustainable finance initiative is launching with senior executives of the big banks, super funds, insurance companies, the financial sector, peak bodies and academia, all coming together to set out a roadmap to support better social, environmental and economic outcomes for Australia. Well, a roadmap to be delivered next year. How will that work? Chair of the initiative is Dr. John Hewson. John Hewson, nice to talk. Now, look, there's plenty of activism in this ESG area. Uh, why do we need a new Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative? Well, I think what's important about this initiative is, it, is the unusual level of collaboration across banks, super funds, uh, other, other members of the investment community, civil society, academics, uh, you know, pulling them all together. What's it going to do? Well, there are a lot of things it can do. I mean, obviously, we're talking focused in, focusing on a roadmap, but also, look, there'll be frameworks developed, uh, there'll be um, policy pointers, uh, there'll be, um, you know, suggestions as to how, as a, as a financial system, we can ensure resilience and stability moving forward mm -hmm. while dealing with some of the big challenges, you know, like human well-being and social equity and, uh, and um, investment risk and so on. Uh, if I can come first to an area where I know you've spent a lot of time in, which is climate change and, and energy policy. Mm. Now, what should, well, there's been a lot of pressure obviously on the fossil fuel industry, what should a board of a company like Whitehaven Coal or uh, New Hope, should they just be packing up and going home? No, well, it, it's interesting how the coal industry has responded to the threat of climate change. I mean, if you take climate change on face value and look at the 2050 projections, uh, a significant percentage, over 70% of coal that's in the ground today can, should never be mined and burned uh, if you're going to meet that sort of carbon budget uh, in 2050. Mm. And that's a pretty clear direction and some of the bigger miners are already recognising that and responding. I mean, Glencore and, and BHP are even calling for a price on carbon. I mean, they've changed their thinking in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. But I'm surprised that when people have gone to the coal industry and said, you know, you can do other things with coal, you can actually turn it into fuel like they did in the US, you can, you know, have dramatically reduce emissions, you can clean it up, you can reduce emissions, you can, you know, all sorts of technological solutions. They say, mate, you've got to understand, we just dig and ship. If the price falls, we just dig more and we ship more. That's our business model. That's, that thinking, so be clever. That's what you're changing. Saying. And you can be clever about coal. And, um, Equally, um, you know, I think smart companies will take interests in renewables and, and low carbon intensive investments to offset some of the risks that they're running. What about uh, systemic risk? Because it's been talked about in central banks around the world mm. how exposed uh, many businesses are to climate change, including the insurance sector. What about systemic risk and the risk of transition, a very lumpy transition? Well, the risk is, the systemic risk is very real. Um, we, I ran the Asset Owners Disclosure Project for 10 or 12 years and we survey rated and ranked the top investors of the world. The big asset owners are some $45 trillion worth of assets, dominate most stock markets of the world uh, as to their management of climate risk. And um, 
you know, we found initially over half of their book was in, in climate exposed investments and less than 2% was in low carbon intensive investments. That's sort of a 50 to 2 punt mm. that there won't be a climate induced financial crisis which will not only impact on them and their investments but systemically. And uh, we've seen the significant systemic risk when, you know, they could let Beer Stearns fail, but they couldn't let Lehman's fail, so they didn't see the extent of the tentacles. So it's, the climate risk is very real. It can come from either, you know, government policies on climate, or it can come from a, a, a weather shock, an extreme weather shock. You've seen Katrina wipe, wiping out a city. You've seen uh, Sandy go up further up the coast of New York. Oh, they're going to get more. You know, and they're, 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 they're getting more frequent and, and more intense. But also technology is moving at such a pace that, you know, that uh, uh, renewables are so much cheaper now than coal-fired power. And th 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 these sort of changes, if you've stuck in a particular investment group yes. and you haven't recognised the inevitability of that change and the rapidity of that change, yes. of course you're going to suffer the risks. And if you put that together systemically, yes. it's a big risk. So systemic risk, I think, came up this week uh, at the, the AFR uh, Banking and Wealth Summit. David Murray was talking about how super could be, given the amount of money we've got in retail and industry super, a new systemic risk to Australia. Uh, he was calling for much more clarity on exactly what uh, non-listed super funds have in their portfolio and presumably where it is, whether it's inside or outside of Australia. Well, the project I mentioned that we ran was about disclosure, getting them to recognise the risk, measure the risk and respond yes, to the risk. That. And I, su I support it, yes, and I think our super funds, a lot of them, are what we might call um, index huggers, you know, they'll go basically into the stock market, a little bit of fixed interest, a little bit of cash, but they don't, haven't returned much in recent years. They go heavily into the stock markets. And if you look at the, most of the measures of stock markets today, the valuations of stock markets, they're, they're way overvalued. I mean, they're, they're, pre, they're, they're above their pre-29 peak. Industry funds would, of course, uh, boast that they've done very well, thank you very much. But they are some of the um, least um, transparent, if you like, in terms of... They do very well when the market's going up. But let's just put the proposition to them. Let's assume that the market's going to go down by 50%. You know, we are going to have a world recession now that the yield curve is inverted sometime in the next couple of years. Um, you know, you've got a big risk that the market could go down, say, let's say 50 per cent. So you're going to stay in those stocks and just go down with it? And the answer quite often from super funds is, look, mate, we're long term investors. We go up and down with the market. No, no, you can avoid the, you know, the significance of the fall by, by changing your investment strategy as you fear you're getting near the peak. And they quite often don't do that. They do ride it up and down. As we saw that in the GFC. Yes. They wrote off about 40 or 50 percent of the value of the, of the superannuation industry and it's taken the bulk of the last 10 years to recover most of that. John, there's been huge success, I think, on the diversity front uh, in terms of pushing uh, boards of investment funds to move mm. companies and their thinking equally on climate change. The other area that you are going, to, are going to focus on is social inequity. Mm. Um, the, the, the idea that we've got this unequal, the, the haves and the have-nots. Mm. Now, equally, there's uh, concern that particularly with a possible Labour federal government, with the influence of union representation on mm. industry super boards, that this is going to start um, a, a pressure on company boards to push up wages which might not necessarily be in the best interests of the member of the super fund in terms of the returns that the company they're investing in can deliver. That's right. I mean, if you look at part of the declared ACTU agenda, which is to try and rebuild union membership in the private sector, it's fallen to less than 10 percent. It used to be about 50, 60 percent. Uh, and uh, to try and go back to more broad based, uh, industry based, collective bargaining and so on. These are all going to happen at the wrong time if that's where they go. In the super industry they have resisted, industry super funds have resisted simple things like having a majority of independent directors on their board. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be part of the, well, uh, the, the gravy train for union leaders. Now they, they don't want to touch that. That's right, but they, it shouldn't be part of the gravy train for union leaders to end up you know, not only getting well paid as a union leader, yes. but to end up on a superannuation board and get another another. But fee. equally and I hear from people like Heather Riddout that, look, uh, this is going to become another one of those major issues where in the long term it makes total sense to at least uh, look at the issue of social equity Absolutely. because otherwise companies... So how do you marry that with the pressure for wage well, increases? I think the responsibility for s social equity considerations 
uh, really is at board level. I mean, a, a fish rots from the head. The strategies are set at the board level. They appoint the CEO to deliver that strategy and they agree on the remuneration structure to make sure they do agree that strategy. We saw that in the Banking Royal Commission, where the banks have lent too much money to people who couldn't afford it, uh, all in the name of, of, of maximising profit, and they've encouraged their employees to cross-sell, not only do a mortgage, well, which has driven wealth inequality, house, if you like, person, you know, and so on. Uh, because they're a financial conglomerate, they can do that within the existing rules, not necessarily taking any interest in the issue of social equity, or not even thinking about the consequences of giving money to people who. When the housing price turns down, housing prices fall, wages are flat, uh, record levels of household debt. I mean, they have got a monstrous problem sitting there that they've been fundamental in creating. It. Now, if they take a long-term view as a board, you would think there's a, there's a lot more downside in that than there is short-term gain. And, you know, that's, that's the sort of consideration you've got to make. Briefly, can I ask you about the upcoming budget? Because I'm sure you're very focused. I mean, what can we expect from the budget? And what's it got to do to um, help Scott Morrison, I guess, in the polls? I think you'll start, they'll start with an unrealistic, unrealistic assessment of where we sit as an economy and downplay the significance of the global risks of a recession coming in the United States probably in 2020. I mean, uh, they're, they're real risks. Uh, Chinese growth slowing, American growth slowing, European growth slowing at a time where, you know, our household sector is pretty strapped in sort of meeting the cost of living, having run down their savings to pre-GFC levels and having a record level of household debt. They'll probably ignore most of that and they'll give more tax cuts and say, well, you'll feel better about all that. Uh, and uh, they'll talk a bit more about infrastructure and obviously given the standing of the National Party, they'll say a lot more about, you know, regional policy. Whether that's real, or whether it's going to make any difference, I doubt it. I think the electorate is tired of what they see as a pretty self-absorbed short-term game of politics, looking after yourself and you know, your mates, uh, your um, certain special interests, rather than governing in the interests of all people. And I, I think the electorate has largely made up its mind on a lot of these issues. I saw that in the recent New South Wales state election where the level of pre-polling was what, over 20%. People already made up their money and listened to the campaign. They didn't pay any attention to all that. They've heard it all before. And uh, that, is their, that is a big downside. And the budget will just look like it's an extrapolation of past thinking. No new ideas, no you know, sh significant shift in uh, the, their image or their stereotype. And um, I'll probably face an electoral consequence of that. Right. What a prediction. John Houston, thank you very much. Thank you. After the break, World Pay, a company worth around 34 billion US dollars, expands its footprint in Australia. Well, World Pay's Asia Pacific General Manager, Phil Pomford, next. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Let's talk about fintech now. A lot of interest in Australia at the moment with the advent of open banking. Well, Britain's ahead of us on that, of course. And now the largest payment tech company in Britain is launching into the Aussie and New Zealand markets with two offices opening in Australia, targeting our retailers and other businesses, I'd imagine, large and small. Interestingly, WorldPay itself has been taken over by US giant FIS in a $43 billion sale. Pretty heady numbers. Tells you a lot about this this business and the space it's in, I think. But WorldPay General Manager of Global E-Commerce for Asia Pacific is Phil Pomford. He's flown into Australia this week. He joins me now. Phil, thanks for joining me. Oh. Look, tell us about the business of WorldPay and what it actually does. Yep. So we are a global payment processor. Yes. We're a technology company. We're here to help merchants, whether that is in a, in a shop environment, in the UK and the US, yeah. or in the division that I sort of represent here in Asia Pacific, the e-commerce division. So right. we truly help merchants sell globally around the world. So what sort of shops on the on the high street in Britain? Because you you can you actually are responsible for what 40% of the high street in the UK? Absolutely, yeah. it's around that mark. Yeah, we, we are the number one in the UK. We are the number one in the US when it comes to point of sale. But in the e-commerce division, where I am and where we are expanding in this region here. Yeah. Yes. You know, our focus really is around helping customers truly tap into that global marketplace. Okay, so 
presumably the competition that you're trying to um, uh, you know st steal market share from are, apart from anything else our big four banks here um, why do you offer something that they won't already be across what do you offer that's different you know absolutely look we, we compete with the traditional players in every market that we operate in we compete with a number of different sort of fintech companies as you say around yeah. the world today but I think you know World World Pay differentiates itself you know we really have the largest breadth of a, a credit card acquiring licenses around the world over 50 countries around the world we have local licenses to process Visa and MasterCard yes but we don't just offer Visa and MasterCard we also offer a huge array of alternative payments so you know we talk about the likes of PayPal or Alipay or WeChat Pay some of the big Chinese um, payment yes. pr uh, producers we offer over 300 of those globally so for a customer or a merchant in Australia who is looking to sell globally which most people are on the e-commerce you know, through that channel yep. we offer that capability for them to look really truly globally offer multiple currencies across the world and do you see a lot more um, Asian cards being used now in Australia I mean I was speaking to Maggie Joe at Alipay she was yep. saying yeah look we're, we're doing it place, places like uh, Priceline I think Absolutely. that sort of thing but do you see a lot more of that happening down here we see it here and we see it globally I mean Alipay mm. and WeChat Pay have been two real sort of you know, the, they're the, the leaders in terms of sort of what we call super apps you know they're mm -hmm. not just a payment app they're a lifestyle app people spend mm -hmm. enormous amounts of hours within that app and they use it as a payment app as well but we are seeing them that their strategy was always to follow where the Chinese tourists went but now they're increasingly you know, growing that out from say airports or the luxury retail they're growing that to the high streets as well. how does Phil how does your business model differ from say the big banks in terms of uh, as well I mean you talked about the products that you can yep. can use but also what about the margins and from a retailers point of view yep. what they need to pay yeah no, absolutely I, mean, I, I think you know every single merchant is slightly different in how we sort of work so it's very difficult to say one size fits all from a yes. cost perspective I think how we differentiate ourselves payment is our core of what we do we only do payments yep. so our, you know, we, as, a, as a combined business today we process over 40 billion transactions globally mm. what that allows us to see is a huge amount of data now data is fantastic unless but only good if you use it properly so we help our merchants understand the markets they're going into we try and grow up their acceptance rate we try and help them reduce fraud to that data as well so I think there's some of the key differences from a global perspective that we offer some of our customers. Okay, uh, I mentioned you know uh, tech, uh, fintech in in Britain being perhaps a little bit ahead of us at the moment. Uh, of course, this entire business was spun off out of RBS as one of the bailout conditions, and it's it's now worth WorldPay is now worth what the same thing that RBS is worth. Is that yeah, right? I mean, I can't comment on the exact exact figures, but I think you know it's been exciting. We, we are part it's of a bit of a sadness for RBS, you'd think, wouldn't it be? <laughs> I mean, were you at RBS at the time? I wasn't, no. I, I, I've been with WorldPay for about six and a half years, just as, after we came out. It's sort of <laughs> private equity. So it, it's, it's been a fantastic story of investment, to be honest with yes. you. Know, we've invested in the business, technology, people. We've doubled the size of our team. We've mm. spent an enormous amount of money on technology to make sure that we are here to provide the and right And why solutions. Australia? Why do you see Australia as the full of opportunity? So we've actually been in Australia and present in Australia for a number of years. We've had a license here to provide services. We have a number of customers here. It was just the right time for us from a customer sort of um, you know, numbers perspective to bring people down into the marketplace mm -hmm. and you know also we've got people now who can sit in front of customers you know impart the expertise that we have from a global perspective mm. help these customers really truly understand how they sell globally and you know we also we've, we've entered New Zealand as well as part of this sort yeah. of whole investment yeah and you know both markets are full of fantastic entrepreneurial businesses that are looking to I have to it. ask you before you go of course you have now just been world pay big as it is has just been taken over by frankly your US rival really FIS uh, how is that going to work and particularly how is it going to work in in Australia as you're coming in because they're in here as well yeah. Look, you'll appreciate I probably can't talk a huge amount it's yeah. one week into it the, you know, the, 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 the paint is still very very fresh on the deal yeah um, but I think both organizations see huge opportunity and are very very excited to be working together we, we don't really compete in any ways yes. we're actually very complementary to each other and we're really excited over the next coming weeks to see how we can actually leverage each other's assets to really help again our customers grow and that, that's our focus all right I look forward to seeing how the synergies come through uh, Phil Romford, Pomford thank you very much all right well that is all for the show tonight tomorrow night a big one liner CEO Amanda Lacaze and uh, Microsoft global president and chief legal officer Brad Smith has a lot to say about Christchurch thanks for your company